So looking at the lady with hypertension and this young man with hematuria, oh, is it this one? The big goal is to look at attenuating and trying to slow down their progression. So when I see them in the renal clinic, I'm just going to want to do a quick check-in with them. What is their level of understanding? What, are they, what were they told from their healthcare professionals, from the community? Um, do they know what stage of CKD they're at? And kind of review the labs with them. Uh, we're going to want to, number one, target their blood pressures. We want uh, blood pressure, as Paul mentioned, less than 130 over 80. Some of these people, if they're not reaching their target, we really encourage home readings, and that's something that we'll go over and um, recommend a, f a few of the different brands that they have right now, some amazing ones, especially if someone ha also has atrial fib, irregular heart rates. There's some really good machines out there for them and to bring in some of their readings at the following clinic or when they're getting follow-up with their family doctor. For someone who has diabetes, we know that blood sugar control is very important. That's not the case for these two patients, but uh, we'd like an A1C less than 7% as going by the CDA guidelines. The other important issue for them is to identify and look at uh, implementing some of the cardiovascular risk um, uh, strategies, so looking at, you know, are they smokers, is there a way that we can do uh, smoking cessation, exercise, uh, we actually have an exercise program for the mantle renal program, we have fitness coordinators for all stages of CKD as well as people on dialysis, and also uh, lower salt diet, and that's very, very important. So as Paul mentioned, we don't typically have a dietitian and a pharmacist follow these patients uh, in the clinic, but if there are some patients who are really having problems with their dietary issues, especially with the sodium, for example, then we will consult the dietitian. Um, I'd like to give them examples of some of the nephrotoxic agents that they need to avoid, so we kind of go over the list with them so that we can protect their kidneys longer. And looking at ROS, yes, ROS is a little bit more complicated. So I'm just going to kind of go through some of the things that we do in our renal clinics. Um, typically, uh, we have the interdisciplinary clinic team follow the stage 4 or 5, but there are some of our stage 3 patients that are progressing more rapidly, so they're included in our, in our interdisciplinary team. So this is where it's very important. And why, why is that is because we want to try and um, reduce hospitalization for these people, get them involved in the care. We want to minimize the complications, and we want to prevent some of those sudden onsets of dialysis. Okay, so they need a lot of education. So when we look at uh, the interdisciplinary clinic, we've actually developed a clinic record, and we're, trying, we're looking at standardizing this across Manitoba, and eventually we're getting a... a um, the uh, merit program where it's going to be uh, on online. So when you look at this, this is a, a record that all of the disciplines will be using. So I'm going to focus more on the um, nursing piece. So what do we do as a nurse? So we're looking at um, when we see these patients, we're going to want to do their vital signs, their weight. We're going to look to see. And we always refer back to the last clinic records. Um, Roz, this is her first time in our renal clinic, so there's going to be a lot of information and no doubt very overwhelming for this lady. So we're going to want to look at what is their blood pressures. Obviously, Roz, is, is, uh, that's the number one issue that we have. There's a lot of education that goes on. We're, I'm going to want to look at uh, the trended blood work as well, so focusing on the creatinine and EGFR. Um, we also provide... Um, uh, education and vaccinations, for example. So we do all the serology for the hepatitis. Um, we provide uh, pneumovax, and also we do the two-step MATU for those who are getting worked up for transplant. As for the education piece, um, we're really going to focus uh, on the anemia and uh, fluid management for this lady. I'll get into that. But we also want to identify some of the um, uremic symptoms. So we have a checkbox, and I don't know if you could see it there. Uh, we'll look at some of the uremic symptoms. Now, Roz is already displaying some of these, but they could be from other issues as well. So that's what we kind of have to sort out. Uh, some of the uremic symptoms that we typically will see will be the nausea, vomiting, uh, fatigue, where they want to sleep all the time, the, the restless legs. Um, they have a lot of problems with the generalized itch because of the minerals are unbalanced. And uh, also they can have a lot of problems with the shortness of breath because of the fluid retention. So getting back to Roz, 
what's her priority? You know, this is overwhelming, like I said. She's already appro approaching end-stage kidney disease. We're not gonna be able to address everything at this one clinic visit. Typically, we've got about 15 minutes per discipline so that we can keep the flow of the clinic going. So there's gonna be a lot more education going on between the clinic visits with Roz, okay? But I'm gonna to want to look at what is, uh, do another check-in, what is her past experience? What does she know? Does she know that she's at this stage of kidney disease? What does she know about dialysis? And uh, so what's her CKD knowledge? And how does she learn best? You know, and you're also looking at assessing their readiness to learn too. Where are they at? So for her, I think the number one priority is we need to get that blood pressure under control. And Paul talked about the cardiovascular risks for these patients, and we really need to get that uh, blood pressure under control, looking at the fluid balance. So um, I would strongly encourage the home blood pressure readings. Is she able to do that, or does she have a family member that can help her? Does she need home care support for this? Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, check-ins as well in between clinic visits. She may even come in to see the nurse to do uh, so that we could do an assessment on her fluid balance and see where her blood pressures are at. Okay, and she'll be seeing the rest of the team too for, for that for that aspect. So her hemoglobin is 82, and she's also iron deficient. Um, she's going to be seeing the pharmacist, to, and they'll be making recommendations, but um, chances are this lady will be uh, ordered IV iron and also probably uh, EPREX, erythropoietin therapy. So that's something, once she's seen all of us, then I'll need to take her aside to do further education on anemia management. So she's going to need monthly labs to look at her iron stores and her hemoglobin, and she's also gonna need, I, we would want to see where she, how she's uh, progressing as well with her chronic kidney disease, especially when you're adjusting their diuretics. You may see a, a, an increase in their creatinine, so we wanna see where she's at with that. As for renal replacement therapy, we'll, we'll look to see how she learns best. Does she want a kidney binder? Does she use internet? What kind of information can I provide her? But really, I'm gonna have to take her uh, bring her in on another visit to focus on that section of uh, modalities. Um, we provide one-on-one -on -one education. We also have at all the facilities group classes for these patients. Um, and then also we'll look at you know, which modality would be best for her. Because typically when someone is running less than 20% of kidney function, you want to start developing a plan for them. So you want to know which, if their kidneys were to fail, what's best for them, which one would they uh, start with. Keeping in mind that a lot of our patients who have end-stage renal disease have had opportunities where they've had a variety where they've started on peritoneal dialysis and then had a transplant, failed transplant, went on hemo, so there's a whole, ver they may experience all modalities in their life, but we prefer to have them more educated and informed so that they can start the one that they prefer as opposed to starting urgently in, in, in uh, using a central line in hemodialysis. The other concern I have is her diabetes. So uh, when we looked at the clinic record, there was a section, uh, I'd like to know if she was recently in hospital, did she have any ER visits, any procedures done, but I'm gonna wanna know just a little bit about her diabetes, uh, is she monitoring? Um, when is she having these hypoglycemic events? And there's a concern with her, with her, her being on maximum dose of glyburide and metformin. So when the pharmacist sees her, she's going to make some recommendations for some of those changes. But I'm going to want to know: Is she getting help in the community? Who's helping her manage her diabetes? Does she see an endocrinologist? And uh, at times. Uh, it's not uncommon that when someone is this complex, they may need to, uh, we'll refer to an endocrinologist or some diabetes education in the community. So Paul mentioned earlier about timely referral, and this is something that's very, very important. And looking at this lady who's down to 16%, her EGFR being at 16, approaching end stage, she's very complex with a lot of in-depth care that's required for these people. So we need to see them earlier, and there's a lot of information we're going to have to go through with her. So we'll, I'll touch base a little bit on renal replacement option, therapy options. There's uh, In Manitoba, we have the kidney transplant at HSC. We also, our number one thing we want to focus on is can we get these people transplanted? I'll talk a little bit about that on the uh, preemptive transplant. 
but also looking at home modalities. Um, home dialysis is one of the options that we're really encouraging. So can they do home peritonodialysis or home hemodialysis? You're probably more familiar with the in-center hemodialysis. Uh, and now there's a, another program called assisted peritonodialysis where people can, they prefer to do the peritonodialysis at home, but they need the support. So in the city, we have like home care aides that come out to do the hookup for these patients. And of course, knowing that dialysis is an option or transplant, there's also end of life care. And we have had patients that said, you know, when the time comes when my kidneys fail, I'd rather be palliative. And, and, and so then we would provide, uh, we would consult palliative care and help them with their end of life care. In saying that though, I've had patients where they've wanted that and when the time came, they've made some changes, they've changed their mind or the family, they were having a hard time dealing with it and they weren't ready. So the patients decided then to try a modality. So briefly on transplant, this is fairly new. We developed a um, transplant assessment form and this is again to help streamline and trying to encourage plant transplant among our dialysis patients or our renal clinic patients. So there's a very specific criteria for referral and this is all done at HSC. So the whole purpose of this is so that we can do some preliminary work and um, blood test and labs and diagnostic tests before they get seen at the transplant clinic. So this is something that might be good for Roz. At this point, uh, like I said, we'll need to find out more as to what's going on, what's her social support, uh, is this something that would interest her, and um, then we can start the whole referral process. So transplant is, um, is got excellent benefits. You've got, you don't need dialysis, a lot better survival outcomes, less restrictions, and um, the preemptive transplant, I don't know if you're familiar with, but this is something that, this is why we developed that form is because we really need and see these patients earlier because you really want them to get a preemptive transplant. We've had a, a lady um, recently, and uh, two ladies actually received a kidney transplant, and one was from her spouse and one was from her sister. So they were able to get it, they were down to, one was down to 6% of function, the other one was, was at eight. They were holding their own, they weren't clinically uremic, so although we look at the EGFR, they weren't clinically uremic. So we were able to get them worked up and they got a live donor from a family member. And some people can get it from a friend as well. So that's the whole goal. Is, and I can't tell you what the stats are right now on preemptive transplant, but I could tell you that there's not enough. So we really need to do our work and we gotta get these people prepared and seen sooner so that we can get them to avoid dialysis, which would be nice. The other fairly new program is called the pair donors, and that's something where you may have a couple where the spouse wants to donate to the, their, their loved ones, but they don't have the, the blood group is not compatible. So what they do is they go into a national database, and there may be another couple similar to them in another province, and that's where they could do the pairing. Okay, so it's kind of thinking outside the box, and we're seeing more of that as well. So another re referral form, and this is for modality assessment, so if someone's interested in the home hemo or the home peritoneal dialysis, we designed a standardized form. Again, when you're looking at those home modalities, there is a criteria, So, and there's also certain things can be a contraindicated for these patients. So we kind of have to have a review to look at their suitability, um, if, they're, if this is something that's good for them. Here's Roz. I'm trying to visualize her with peritoneal dialysis. So this is the, the twin bag, the CAPD that she's attached to. Um, it's a fairly easy dialysis. The training's about a week long. My one concern for Ross is that I need to know more her social support. She's a young lady, she's 60 years old. And I could say young, eh? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> years ago I may not have said that, but grandma, yeah. So. But what's interesting with Roz is that she is having problems with retinopathy. So I'm going to want to know to what extreme is her retinopathy. You know, can she, does she have the dexterity for the connection? Can she, can she read some um, 
writing material, um, has she had laser surgeries, where is she at with all that? Because it's relatively easy and especially for our population who live out of town or in the northern communities, this is a great option for them so they don't have to relocate. A uh, lot less uh, dietary and fluid restrictions and less cardiovascular stress because it's a daily dialysis, so it's more of a gentler process. And the beauty of it is that you don't need vascular access, so it actually preserves their veins longer. And the residual renal function that they are still making urine is very, it's like gold, so that, that helps out as well too. So this is offered at St. Boniface, St. Boniface and at Seven Oaks. Um, most of our patients will go on the night machine, the night cycler, so it frees up their day. So this is something that um, I think would be an option for Roz. Um, she's not, she doesn't have a lot of adhesions. She doesn't have any problems with uh, diverticulitis or other um, bowel conditions, so uh, Crohn's, for example. So that's something that we would want her worked up where she can get a formal assessment with either St. Boniface or at Seven Oaks. As for home hemo, that's actually a picture of a patient that was being trained over at, at HSC. You only see part of his leg. So anyways, uh, that's one of the home hemo machines that we currently use. And home hemo, again, has wonderful benefits. These, these people have a lot greater independence and flexible schedules. They could do short daily dialysis or um, nocturnal hemodialysis that Paul's involved with. And uh, the benefits are, are amazing. Their health outcomes are great. They have less medications and diet issues. If anything, uh, we've even had to add phosphate to their bath, which is like unheard of for a dialysis patient. Um, these, it, it is, you have to be quite motivated to do this. And so your self-care, uh, you can't expect your spouse to do it. It has to come from the patient. And the, the training session is more intense. There's a two-month training session, about eight weeks, say, two-month training session. And also, um, we've, we've had this not only in the city. We have actually have a, a person up north who's on the home hemodialysis. So it's something that's becoming more recognized. And they, of course, anyone for the hemodialysis would need a vascular access. So again, considering Roz, if she's interested in home hemo or in center dialysis, she's going to need referral f to the vascular team, to the vascular nurse and surgeon to look at her vessels. And she does have cardiovascular uh, history and also diabetes. And so hopefully her vessels are not too small because then that makes it more of a challenge to get a fistula in these people. So you need more time. You've got to refer them. They, have to have, they may need diagnostic tests before they actually have the surgery. And that has to also develop once they have the fistula. So again, that's why we need to see them sooner. So I'm um, just going to wrap up here. Um, what I just want to say is thinking of your patient population, the people that you follow, um, knowing the risk factors for CKD, the, the take-home messages, what is their blood pressure, are they within target, uh, are they spilling proteins in the urine, so looking to see the albumin-creatin ratio, pro protein-creatin ratio, and also looking at their labs. What is their creatinine and estimating their EGFR? We do have a booth out here, and we do have a, a computer a laptop where we have the uh, pathways online. So if you're interested in coming to have a peek at the pathways, we'll be there at lunch and then they break this afternoon. So thank you. I'm going to pass you now.